Learn more about the prophet Elijah in Elijah and the Widow on page 140 of the Spark Story Bible. Our first reading is from 1 Kings 19, verses 4 through 8. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he laid down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him, and said, Get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up, and he ate and drank. And then he went in the strength of that food for forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. This is the story of Elijah, a prophet with quite the story to tell. From the scripture read, however, you wouldn't quite grasp that. You'd think, oh, it's just another one of those stories about how when we admit to our wrongdoings, God forgives us and our sins, replenishing us with life, but this time, the good kind. I was very much deceived by Elijah's story upon first reading. I found myself listing off times I've been forgiven in my own life, from silly examples such as taking the last scoop of ice cream in the freezer without my family hating me, to more profound and meaningful examples, such as arguing with my parents and then seeing them get past my irrationality. Although, although I believe it's an essential characteristic of God and the moral that we should, all, we should all seek in ourselves, I didn't want to boringly repeat a theme that we've been hearing about our whole lives. So I looked further into the text. It turns out I'd been completely thrown off by the selected scripture, and there's a humongous part of Elijah that you don't know about. The previous chapter opens us up to the baffling yet intriguing story of Elijah, where God sends him to the king of Israel, Ahab, to announce the end of a harsh, three-year-long, and basically lifeless drought. Right as Elijah meets Ahab, he's confronted as the troubler of Israel. Instantly, Elijah disputes this statement, saying it is not he who is the troubler of Israel, but it is Ahab, for he has allowed the worship of false gods, the Baals. Elijah, with quite the excessive and disturbing resolution of the conflict, proposes a contest. No, not a contest where they harmlessly settle with rock, paper, scissors. Elijah wickedly comes up with the idea of an ox sacrificing context. Whoever's God responds to the sacrifice is the winner. And so they construct two altars and prepare them for the sacrifice. Elijah, as pompous as he is, allows the Baal prophets to pray first for their ox to be sacrificed. After a long day of Elijah laughing, taunting, and saying some things his mother would probably give him a spanking for, there was not the slightest of a response from the Baal god. Now it's Elijah's turn to give it a shot. After only a short time of prayer, lightning fell from the sky, burning the altar, and it even began to rain, proving God's responsiveness. As if that wasn't enough for Elijah, to satisfy this already mad contest, he ordered the death of the prophets of Baal, all 450 of them to be exact. As absurd as this story already sounds, God was satisfied with Elijah for believing in him and fighting against those who didn't. Aside from God, essentially essentially everybody was against him. So he escaped to under the broom tree where he sits in the scripture open to the healing of God. As many of you know, earlier this summer, the senior high youth group trucked down to Eastern Kentucky for our annual work camp. Work camp has become one of my favorite weeks of the year, full of amazing people, life-changing experiences, and abundance of God's healing. This year's work camp was something special, with us being split into small groups assigned to work site that we return to each day for the entire week. From the physical labor varied at each site, from building a new porch so that a family had a safe exit from their home, to digging a drainage ditch behind a mobile home so that water would not rush under the home, causing a multitude of problems. At our specific site, a family with six was living in a single bedroom and living room, as the addition at the back of their home with two full bedrooms was left unoccupied due to mold growth from the flooding of a nearby creek. 
With the help of our creative and very patient leaders, David Showalter and Jill Brady, we were able to design a complicated system of support, of girt, support system of girders that we would install under the previous choice, strengthening supports enough so that the floor could be raised six inches, preventing the threat of future floods and mold growth. However, it wasn't the physical labor and mental exhaustion that made this work, this made me most satisfied with this week. As much as I love seeing progress to making a home warmer, safer, and drier, there isn't much to take away from a day of solely physical labor, besides perseverance and sore muscles. And I'm glad, because unlike the last word camp in Kentucky, there were people living in the homes we worked on. So we were able to bond with them throughout the week whenever we weren't working. Our family of six included a mother and father, a sassy yet amusing 10-year-old girl, two energy-filled boys of ages five and six, and lastly, an adorable baby girl. Every moment that we weren't occupied with work, they wanted our attention. The older girl, Marissa, enjoyed provoking conflict among our group as she had us compete to be the top of her favorite person rankings list. <laughs> Sadly, I never made it near the top, but that's besides the point. However, the two boys, Daniel and Jordan, had so much joy to share with us all. Each morning, we would arrive to them already playing outside, waiting for us so they could have all the attention they could possibly get. One of my most fond memories of Daniel and Jordan would be their ceaseless desire for us to give them piggyback rides. Whether we were working or not, it didn't matter. They would come up to us and ask, piggyback ride? So we'd eventually give in to their requests, and with them on our, sho our shoulders, we'd run down to the neighbors acting like horses, jumping over the miscellaneous items in the yard as they'd yell at me to giddy up. It was in moments like these that although I was extremely winded from the running, I felt relieved, physically and emotionally, escaping the exhaustion of labor. Oftentimes I'd tell myself, there needs to be a limit on how many piggyback rides I give a day. In the moment, it didn't feel like I was actually accomplishing anything necessary when I spent time with the kids rather than working at home, on the home. Looking back, I've come to realize in the moments that I put my hammer down and took off my work gloves, I was doing more for myself than I'd ever imagined. I was opening myself to the healing of joy, the healing that comes from God in the moments that we step aside from the need to be constantly productive. In this story of Elijah, God intervened at one of the most successful points of his life. He just recently had proved God's power to all of Israel and rid of many Baal prophets. However, it was this impulse to do more that brought him to God. God offers him an angel with food, a chance to be both relieved and healed. It is in this story we can see God doesn't always expect us to accomplish everything. He doesn't need people to spend their entire lives dedicated to doing good solely for the purpose of being a servant to him. By no means am I encouraging you to stop achieving great things, but I do, I do encourage you to rethink your efforts you make on a daily basis. In our fast-paced society, we often feel as if we often feel as if we're wasting time whenever we're not physically doing something. However, there's no reason for us to be constantly occupied. We aren't always expected to accomplish the most overwhelming tasks. Many times, God only wishes that we revive ourselves. As in Elijah's case, he didn't focus on himself enough. Just as Daniel and Jordan offered us a well-deserved break, the food and attention given to Elijah by the angel was God's effort to feed his soul as it wasn't sufficiently filled with the patience and tranquility he needed. It's pretty often that you'll find me in my room, lying in my bed, listening to music. It's in this place I feel most comfortable, most familiar, but still disconnected. I come to this place when there simply isn't anything else for me to be doing, but other times I choose to come here when I'm filled with emotions, both good and bad, and maybe excited, upset, or angry, so I'll separate myself from the world by putting in my earbuds. In these moments, I feel most connected to God. Although it may only last for a matter of minutes, I appreciate alone time, where I can replenish myself through disconnection, dedicating time and space to getting away. I've learned that when we intentionally open our minds and souls to God's healing, he'll be there, feeding us the food we need to continue. We as humans are allowed to be selfish, we need to be able to spend time on ourselves, working to better as a whole. Sometimes, all that's needed is the simplest of relief and healing to transcend ourselves to where we'd like to be. However, 
Lying in your bed listening to music isn't everybody's way to heal. Whatever it may be, periodically make an effort to get away. Because when we disconnect from the world, God will show up, waiting to feed our souls. Amen. Reading from Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen. Several weeks ago, I visited Washington, D.C. with my family. It was our first time in D.C., and we did all the normal touristy things, touring the Capitol and Congress, the Supreme Court building, and visiting various monuments. On the last day, we decided we had just enough time to visit the Holocaust Museum. I was not prepared for what we would find there. It is a remarkable museum. In the permanent Holocaust exhibit, There are three main sections. One that focuses on Hitler's rise to power, one on the so-called final solution of mass killing of Jews, and finally, the liberation. While moving through this exhibit, I often had to look away from the film clips as I felt nauseated and overwhelmed. It is hard to fathom cruelty of this magnitude. But as I continued through the exhibit, one thought hung in my brain. How could these men and women, the ones who persecuted and tortured and killed so many innocent people, how could they, the guilty, ever be forgiven? Who could do such a thing? This calls to mind the central question in today's scripture. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? Yes, we are all sinners and all seek forgiveness, But aren't there some sins that are unforgivable where redemption is not a possibility? I'm not proud to say that I rarely listen to the nightly news, but it's depressing to hear the daily litany of all the terrible stuff that is happening and not be able to do anything. ISIS wrecks havoc in Syria and surrounding countries. Boko Haram threatens Nigeria. The famine in Ethiopia has displaced thousands. Our own nation is plagued by poverty and gun violence and racism. A Glen Ellen Uber driver was arrested for threatening the life of Mayor Rahm Emanuel. Though the Holocaust may be the most notorious example of human violence, Nazis do not have a monopoly on terror. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? This question from Psalm 130 describes God's relentless love for us, God's deep and perpetual forgiveness of our sins. It is a comforting passage, which offered new hope for the people of Israel. But as I walked through the Holocaust Museum that day, it troubled me. How can I believe in a God that will forgive not only our common, everyday sins, but also the world's greatest atrocities? How does one believe in a God that redeems those who commit murder and rape, who support genocides and terrorism? As I walked through the exhibit at the museum in Washington, I felt something new brewing inside me, anger. How could God forgive the Nazis, the guilty, 
without somehow betraying the Jews and others who suffered so deeply? How could our God, our source of love and light, accept and redeem these people that I find so unforgivable? I do not understand. And I'll just tell you right now, that's my thesis. That's my point this morning. I do not understand. God cannot be understood. As Katie discussed in her sermon last week, this summer all of the interns read a wonderful book, Pastrix, The Cranky, Beautiful Faith of a Sinner and Saint by Nadia Boltzweber. Weber grew up in the conservative Church of Christ, which she soon rejected. She later became an alcoholic and semi-atheist who rejected all mainstream religion. But then, miraculously, she comes full circle and returns to church as a Lutheran minister. Weber chronicles her winding, rocky road back to faith with disarming honesty. And she shares this central insight that I both resisted and needed to hear. God cannot be understood. She explains, I need a God who is bigger and more nimble and mysterious than what I could understand and contrive. Otherwise, it can feel like I am worshiping nothing more than my own ability to understand the divine. Like Weber, I can't believe in a God that is confined by my own human ability to understand. I can't believe in a God that's limited by my brain and its ability to comprehend. I need to believe in something bigger. And part of this belief in something bigger is accepting the fact that I cannot and will not understand some facets of my faith. Not understanding is uncomfortable. It can be awkward and stressful, but maybe we have to learn to, un to, learn to embrace this discomfort and confusion if we are to believe in and love and worship something that is so much larger than ourselves. This is not how I envisioned my sermon. When we started this internship at the beginning of the summer, I imagined myself delivering this profound, scholarly, yet also charmingly witty sermon that would, be, <laughs> that would be full of unique insights. Writing this sermon almost felt like a defeat. The fact that God works in indescribable and mysterious ways that I just don't get doesn't feel like the deep and thoughtful message I had planned on. But thinking back on this summer, Perhaps one of the most important lessons I learned during this internship is that mystery and confusion and uncertainty are not weaknesses to be overcome, but to be embraced as the heart of my faith. They should be taken seriously. I learned the beauty of mystery each time Kendra would, out of nowhere, ask us this broad, deep question that none of us could manage to find any sort of answer to. I learned the necessity of confusion when we were suddenly split up and sent out on rounds with the chaplains at Elmhurst Memorial Hospital. I learned that faith thrives on uncertainty through talking to students and faculty members at Elmhurst College, Chicago Theological Seminary, and the University of Chicago Divinity School, as they all described the difficulties they had discerning their own individual calls to ministry. Maybe it's not the most profound of lessons, the deep intellectual thought I had envisioned. But it's important and it's necessary for us to recognize that by being people of faith, we accept and embrace mystery. People do really terrible things on this earth. And frankly, I don't have to forgive and forget these acts. And God's divine redemption of these people is not something that I understand. But celebrating mysteries is what this whole crazy endeavor that we call faith is all about. Amen.